uh, in the beginning. We're about 14 minutes late. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, the traffic coming into Leicester was particularly heavy with the, the football today. Indeed, we're competing with several other uh, attractions, not just the Leicester home game, but uh, Ronaldo's homecoming at Old Trafford. If I'd known that, I wouldn't be here myself. <laughs> so I'm counting on my friends to tic-tac me uh, with the, uh, the uh, scores as they go in. It's also, of course, more importantly, uh, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attack on the United States on 9-11-2001. A premeditated, deliberate attempt to uh, massacre thousands of civilian people, uh, almost certainly inspired by, maybe organized by, uh, the Al-Qaeda network uh, led by Osama bin Laden and everyone remembers as they say what they were doing uh, when those airplanes hit the Twin Towers and then later the Pentagon. Uh, I myself was watching it live when the second plane hit and as soon as the second plane hit I was writing an article for The Guardian, in those days I could, uh, when Seamus Milne was the comment editor, knowing that it would be uh, published and making plain in that article my belief that people inspired by at least uh, Bin Laden, the mass murderer, uh, had carried out this heinous act. And as soon as I finished the article, I phoned my friends in Iraq and warned them, though they needed, I'm sure, no warning, that this would undoubtedly be embraced as a casus belli for a war on Iraq, an invasion and occupation of Iraq. And in that too, though no particular genius was required, uh, I was proven Right. I predicted that Iraq would be blamed for the uh, attack on the United States, uh, even though a moment's reflection uh, would have shown that to be flatly untrue. Uh, the kind of Islamist fanaticism represented by bin Laden and al-Qaeda uh, had the Iraqi regime as much in their sights as any other regime in the world. Bin Laden and Saddam Hussein hated each other, were at war with each other. The idea that Iraq would cooperate with the uh, Islamist terror organizations, then Al-Qaeda, of course, preeminent amongst them, was flatly ridiculous, but I knew that the false connections would be drawn, and indeed they were. Some of you are too young to remember, but the days following 9-11, all kinds of horrific lives were plastered across the front pages of Western newspapers, including the lie that uh, Iraq had a terror school at which these hijackers had been trained. The trained to cut people's throats with box cutters, how to seize airplanes and so on. All of it lies. The lie in the Sunday Times still never retracted that the leading hijacker, uh, Mohammed Atta, had met with, in Prague, in the airport, very detailed, the head of Iraqi intelligence at that time. A complete lie. But of course, part of a carpet of lies that had paved the way up until this point in history. Uh, and so I was sure uh, that this uh, heinous attack would lead to the invasion and occupation of Iraq. It turned out 
Afghanistan was first, and we all know how that ended up. We all know what was spent on that. We all know the ocean of blood that was spilt in that. And we all know it was to absolutely no purpose. Every person who died in the last 20 years in Afghanistan died for nothing, including, of course, hundreds of our own young men and even, I think, one or two women uh, in our armed forces that were sent on a pack of lies to occupy Afghanistan. And we know how it all ended up. The one thing that most people don't know, and I and my comrade, Dr. Ranjit Bra, are uh, going to uh, try to set out just before we show the film, is where all of this lies in the big picture. Everybody knows what happened in Afghanistan. Everybody says you were right. Everybody knows what happened in Iraq. Everybody says you were right. But not everybody is yet persuaded that these wars, these crimes, lie seamlessly in one garment. And that garment is called imperialism. What is imperialism, asks a young woman of Jim Flory uh, in George Orwell's first novel, Burmese Days. What is this imperialism you keep talking about? And Flory, who's really Orwell, his first job was as a colonial official in Burma, answers, it's going to other people's countries and stealing their things. I've read big books on imperialism, but that's as good a definition in one sentence as you're ever going to find. This crime in Iraq, crime in Afghanistan, is a part of a greater body of crime, which flow ineluctably from the notion that some countries, some heavily quotes, civilizations, you may recall George W. Bush knuckles trailing the ground, daring to use that word civilizations. Some civilizations have a right given by someone, God perhaps, to go around the world invading other people's countries and stealing their things. Best summed up by Donald Rumsfeld, now deceased, when he literally asked, on TV. What can we do, he said, if God put America's oil under other people's countries? <laughs> it was a moment of rare honesty from the American administration. They did regard it as America's oil. And the fact that it was under other people's countries was only tolerable if those countries were puppets of the United States and its empire. Iraq, whatever else it was, was no longer, at least, a puppet of the American empire and therefore intolerable uh, to the United States. The film you're about to see is an important chapter in the story of Iraq for lots of reasons, the most of which is the most uncomfortable. And it is this, that the British state will stop at nothing, nothing, to repel all borders. Any one of us could have ended up on Harrodan Hill, especially me, if you think about it. Luckily, I never go into woods, <laughs> and I would never, under any circumstances, commit suicide. Write that down. <laughs> the truth is that David 
Kelly, as you'll see in this film, certainly didn't commit suicide. Whatever else happened, and there are other alternatives, whatever else happened, he certainly didn't commit suicide. After the film, uh, we'll have time for Q&A and Dr. Ranjit will address the audience also. But before we go to it, I said that the Kelly story was important for many reasons. And I gave you the first one. But here are some of the others. The British media can be absolutely relied upon to lie and cheat and deceive to do their master's bidding. And their master is the state. And they were prepared, as you'll see from Greg Dyke, the former director general, they were prepared even to devastate their own state broadcaster in pursuit of the lies. Number three is that the British Parliament is completely toothless in the face of state crimes. Usually it's quite happy about that. But if on the odd occasion, like Andrew McKinley that you'll see in the film, you have a difficult customer in the uh, Parliament, uh, they are able and definitely willing to trample underfoot anything that could be described as parliamentary norms, democratic norms. These are all lipstick on the pig of the British state and other states are not different. Most of them. The fourth less from this is that even some as eminent as Dr. David Kelly who was about to be made a knight of the realm. The queen was about to place her sword ceremonially on Kelly's shoulder to make him Sir David Kelly when somebody else, somebody else took a knife across his wrist to cover up for the fact that he was already dead. Just think about that. Now, I don't want to give away too much of the film, so why don't we uh, show it now, and then Dr. Ranjit Brat and I will last. Uh,